Hello all, welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. In today's lecture, we're talking atmospheric dynamics, namely, why does air move around in our atmosphere and what drives that movement? In this section, we'll be defining geostrophic wind and hydrostatic balance. We'll be asking, what drives weather on Earth? What are the physical laws governing atmospheric motion? And what are the forces relevant to atmospheric motion? If after this video you're interested in learning more about atmospheric dynamics, feel free to check out my more advanced YouTube lectures on atmospheric dynamics as part of this channel. Let's get right to it. At a fundamental level, weather on Earth exists primarily to redistribute heat. We've already talked about radiation on Earth, in particular insulation. Our study of insulation revealed that different parts of the Earth's surface receive different amounts of solar radiation per unit area. At the equator, where solar radiation comes from nearly overhead, radiation is distributed over a smaller area, and so there is a greater amount of insulation. At subpolar latitudes, the sun is always low in the sky, that is, sunlight is never from directly overhead, and so, tends, so it tends to be distributed over a larger area. The result is less energy per unit area. These differences in energy received per unit area give rise to temperature differences between equatorial latitudes and polar latitudes. These differences in temperature are also referred to as temperature gradients. These temperature gradients give rise to gradients in pressure or differences in pressure, which in turn induce a pressure force on air parcels. The result is that air parcels start moving around and work to mitigate or reduce these temperature differences. If we're talking about air parcels in the atmosphere, this gives rise to weather. The ocean, being a fluid, responds similarly to temperature differentials through the generation of ocean currents. However, that's a topic for another class. So what are the drivers behind the weather we experience on Earth? There are four main factors that need to be considered when we talk about weather. First, weather exists because the Earth has an atmosphere. If there were no atmosphere, there would be no way that the atmosphere could work to counteract these temperature gradients. If you think about our solar system, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, but it is a planet without an atmosphere. With one side of the planet always facing the Sun, and no atmosphere to redistribute heat, the temperature differential ends up being enormous between the day side and the night side. If the Earth had no atmosphere or ocean, there would be no mechanism to carry heat from equator to pole, and so the temperature differential between these locations would be huge. Second, Latitudinal variation in insulation is responsible for driving temperature and pressure differences within the Earth's atmosphere. This latitudinal variation occurs because the Earth is a sphere. With radiation being more direct at the equator than the pole, temperatures are enhanced at the equator relative to the pole, leading to an imbalance of energy. Pressure differences created by this imbalance are then responsible for driving weather, which acts to even out these differences. Third, Rotation of the planet plays a big role in driving differences in weather across latitudes. Rotation of the planet gives rise to Coriolis force, which directs air parcels to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. This in turn produces large weather systems known as extratropical cyclones that dominate weather in the mid-latitudes. Fourth, water in the atmosphere is key to the water cycle, driving, driving precipitation in the form of snowfall or rainfall. Weather patterns carry water from over the ocean to land or from moister equatorial latitudes poleward. The movement of air in the atmosphere gives rise to weather. The study of the motion of the air and the physical principles giving rise to that motion is referred to as atmospheric dynamics. So how do we understand the dynamics of the atmosphere? Put simply, the fundamental rules that guide our study of the atmosphere come from basic physical principles that have been around for centuries. In essence, there are three basic principles that can be used to derive the equations that govern atmospheric motion. The first physical principle is conservation of mass. Namely, mass cannot be created and cannot be destroyed. Put simply, stuff can't spontaneously appear or disappear. On a large scale, very little mass escapes from the atmosphere per year and very little is added. Consequently, the Earth's atmosphere can be treated as a closed system. The total mass is unchanging and the only thing let in and out is radiation. Consequently, air cannot escape but instead simply move around from place to place. This same principle can be applied to air parcels. The air parcel itself cannot gain or lose mass, but it can be moved around. The second physical principle guiding atmospheric dynamics is conservation of energy. 
As discussed before, energy can take many forms, including thermal energy, that is, energy from motion of molecules on small scales, kinetic energy, such as energy due to bulk motion, or potential energy, that is, energy put into an object by lifting it up. In a closed system, energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can change forms. The Earth's atmosphere is not exactly a closed system in this sense, as it gains energy from solar radiation and loses it through terrestrial radiation. However, when the Earth is in a state of energy balance, gains equal losses and the total energy stays the same. The motion of air parcels can be understood through the transformation of energy between forms. This is enshrined in the first law of thermodynamics. The third physical principle is a consequence of conservation of energy, but gives us an important tool for understanding how the bulk motion of air parcels respond to their environmental forces. This principle is enshrined in Newton's second law of motion, which states that the acceleration an object, or an air parcel in our case, experiences is equal to the sum of forces acting on that object. Some forces arise from air parcels interacting with one another, or because of gravity's pull. In the case of no external forces, this principle becomes a simple statement of conservation of momentum. With no external forces, the momentum of an air parcel must be conserved. Dynamics are most easily described in the context of air parcels. In this context, we can enumerate the three forces that are relevant for describing atmospheric motion. Pressure gradient force, Coriolis and centrifugal force, and gravitational force. We'll now consider these three forces in detail. The primary driver of motion in the Earth's atmosphere is the pressure gradient force, which arises when there is a difference in pressure over some distance. At a simple level, a pressure gradient is analogous to a bathtub where one side of the bathtub has more water on it than the other side. The differences in pressure between these two sides will induce motion from the side with more water to the side with less water. The effect of this induced motion is to equilibrate the water level. In the atmosphere, these pressure differentials are largely created because of temperature differentials because of different radiative heating at different latitudes. In the atmosphere, the pressure gradient force on an air parcel is due to more energetic collisions occurring on one side of the air parcel versus the other. Consider this diagram, showing high pressure on the left and low pressure on the right. The high pressure could be associated with either more molecules, namely a higher density fluid, or faster moving molecules, namely higher temperature fluid. Because there are more collisions and force being induced by the molecules on the left, and fewer collisions and force from molecules on the right, the effect is that the air parcel gets pushed to the right by the pressure gradient. Throughout the atmosphere, areas of high pressure and low pressure, largely created by temperature differences and rising or sinking air, are moved around in time. The me this meteorological map shows a region of high pressure, identified with an H, and a region of low pressure, identified with an L. The effect of the pressure difference between these two locations is to cause air parcels to be pushed from high pressure to low. In essence, we can say that air wants to move from the region of high pressure into a region of low pressure. To see up-to-date maps of pressure at the surface, you can check out windy.com at the link shown here. The second set of forces that are important to the dynamics of the atmosphere are the Coriolis and centrifugal forces. Both of these forces are known as apparent forces since they only exist because air parcels naturally want to travel in a straight line. But as observed, we are measuring them from a location atop of a rotating sphere. That is, both of these forces have an apparent effect on air parcels in the atmosphere because we are on the Earth's surface and the Earth itself is rotating. This distinction between these two is as follows. Coriolis force makes air parcels appear to deflect away from straight line paths through the atmosphere because the observer himself is rotating. We'll talk more about Coriolis force in a moment. Centrifugal force, on the other hand, is responsible for pushing air parcels away from the axis of rotation, much like a weight at the end of a string wants to fly away from its wielder when being swung around in a circle over his head. Centrifugal force is responsible for making the atmosphere bulge out more at the equator, where air is farthest from that axis of rotation. To better understand the Coriolis force, consider this thought experiment. A thrower stationed at the North Pole tosses an air parcel southward towards a receiver sitting in the mid-latitudes. 
Viewed from above the North Pole, such as from a satellite, the Earth itself is rotating counterclockwise. Being right on the axis of rotation, the thrower's position doesn't change, but he keeps his eyes locked on the receiver. The receiver, being farthest towards the hub, rotates towards the east. After some time, the air parcel has moved south along its original trajectory, here towards the bottom of the slide, while the receiver has moved to the right. The effect is that the air parcel now appears to have moved to the right in the eyes of the thrower. It is no longer moving towards the receiver, but is now far to the west. In general, this effect is consistent over large distances, regardless of the original trajectory of the air parcel. They will be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, where rotation is instead clockwise when viewed over the south pole, the effect is the opposite. Air parcels appear to be deflected to the left. That is, they appear to be experiencing a force that is turning them to the left of their direction of motion. A similar and excellent explanation of the Coriolis effect and force is given in this video by the MIT Department of Physics. Two students get to sit on a rotating platform and toss a ball between themselves, showing the Coriolis effect in action. Make sure to check it out at the link shown here. Because the Earth appears to be rotating counterclockwise when viewed above the North Pole, and clockwise when viewed above the South Pole, the effect of the Earth's rotation is to deflect air parcels to the right in the Northern Hemisphere and to the left in the Southern Hemisphere. The strength of the deflection increases the closer one gets towards the poles, with zero deflection at the equator. This means that air parcels moving poleward in either hemisphere will be deflected to the east while air parcels moving equatorward will be deflected to the west. This becomes highly relevant in our understanding of the general circulation of the planet, in particular air parcels moving towards and away from the equator, as we'll touch on in the next lecture. The gravitational force is the third force that is relevant to the atmosphere. The gravitational force is responsible for producing attraction between massive objects. In accordance with Newton's law of gravity, the strength of that attraction increases linearly with the product of the masses of the two objects, and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between those objects. Given the thinness of the atmosphere, this basically means that air parcels are experiencing a constant tug towards the center of the Earth, in accordance with the gravitational constant, 9.8 meters per second squared. The gravitational force works in the vertical, pulling air towards the surface. Along a horizontal surface, the gravitational force is perpendicular to the direction of motion, and so does not play a role in how they move. However, every air parcel is subject to both the pressure gradient and Coriolis force. The pressure gradient force initiates motion, inducing an acceleration that pushes air parcels from high pressure to low. However, air parcels as air parcels begin to move faster, the Coriolis force grows in strength and ends up deflecting those air parcels from a direct trajectory from high to low. Eventually, air parcels setter, settle into a natural balance between pressure gradient force and Coriolis force. This balance gives rise to the geostrophic wind, which, at first glance, may appear to contradict our intuition of how these air parcels move. Instead of moving from high pressure to low, air parcels on a rotating planet tend to move along lines of constant pressure gradient. Although pressure gradient force is trying to pull them into the low, Coriolis force opposes that motion. The air parcels are stymied and tend to instead follow along lines of constant pressure gradient. On the diagram here, we see an air parcel starting to the south. With higher pressure in the south and lower pressure in the north, the air parcel begins to accelerate northward. However, as it gains speed, the Coriolis force strengthens. In the northern hemisphere, this has the effect of turning the steering wheel to the right, causing the air parcel to start moving to the east. As we see in the diagram, this effect continues until pressure gradient and Coriolis balance, driving the air parcel along lines of constant pressure. The geostrophic wind is the primary driver for winds in the mid-latitudes. That is, at a large scale, air in the mid-latitudes moves in such a way that air parcels experience a balance between pressure gradient and Coriolis forces. Away from the tropics, pressure tends to decrease as one goes towards the poles, in response to decreasing temperatures. 
Thus, air parcels that are attempting to go from equator to pole are turned to the east in both hemispheres, producing the dominant storm track, strong winds that come from the west. These winds are then responsible for blowing weather from west to east. In the vertical, Coriolis force has little effect and so air parcels instead experience a balance between pressure gradient force and gravitational force. When air parcels are at rest, neither accelerating up or down, the resulting balance of forces is known as hydrostatic balance. In the diagram shown on the left, the sum of forces from these three arrows must be equal to zero. That is, the sum of the down arrows must equal the up arrows. Since gravity acts to pull air parcels down, this means that the pressure acting on the bottom of the air parcel must be larger than the pressure acting on the top of the air parcel for the parcel to be unmoving. In other words, we need to have more molecules and or warmer molecules beneath an air parcel than above it in order to keep it at a constant altitude. Hydrostatic balance is the dominant balance in the vertical by far, and is necessary to explain the vertical structure of the atmosphere. Namely, hydrostatic balance requires that pressure must decrease as one goes to higher altitude at a rate that is essentially exponential. The rate of decrease is determined by the strength of the gravitational pull, which drives compression of air parcels, and the temperature of the atmosphere, which resists that compression. For the Earth, we obtain that... Uh, that this means that for every 16 kilometer increase in altitude, there is approximately a 90% drop in pressure. Okay, that's enough for today. In the next lecture, we're going to apply the principles discussed today to understand the general circulation of air all around the planet.